Okay, so we'll get started and welcome to What's New in IFS Applications 9, Fleet and Asset Management. My name is Bob Corrigan. I'm with the Established Account Team in North America, and I'll be going through the presentation today. So as always, uh, IFS provides upgrades from all the prior versions to Applications 9 via script upgrade. And this is just a listing of all the different enhancements that have been added version over version. And we'll be talking about uh, Application 9 Release to Market, which was released in uh, May of this year to general distribution around the world. Starting off uh, with some of the enhancements that have been made in the area of fleet management as well as some of the asset management, uh, some changes that were made to the average utilization per serial. Uh, the concept was, in addition to the current way of defining the average utilization per part and maintenance group, the ability to define the average utilization per serial has been introduced in Applications 9. Uh, an average utilization value can be defined uh, specifically for a serial when the utilization of the fleet is irregular. Uh, and in an average utilization value, if the average utilization value has been defined on a serial, this average value will always be utilized first when performing due calculations. Uh, if this has not been defined, the average value will be defined based on the maintenance group for which the serial is used. Here is a uh, indication on the screen of where that takes place, uh, where you define the average utilization per vehicle or serial number. Uh, the average utilization value can be entered either manually or it can be calculated. Uh, the installed serials inherit the values from the top level structure uh, down, and the average value defined on the serial uh, takes precedence over any values that are defined on the maintenance group itself. So here you can see where the screen is in the fleet and asset management serial is a serialized configuration serial um, structure and where the average utilization uh, by serial is included there. So the addition of these values uh, for calculating historical average value per month uh, based on operational loggings for the last 12, planned, which is the uh, planned average value per month, um, is based on the current month defined in the operational budget. Uh, the average value per month is manually entered. Uh, and then the average value per month is inherited from the higher level whenever you want to do a spread uh, for the utilization of the serial. So next we'll go on to the due calculation options. So the due calculation batch job was run for each serial in sequence, which made this uh, pretty tedious and, and not very optimal when you had a lot of um, uh, requirements to run those batches. So to improve this batch job, we've divided the job into what we're calling chunks. And you can run these different chunks in parallel by using uh, the parallel execute uh, package within Oracle. There's a new dialog box that uh, lists all the different uh, due calculations that are valid for a serial uh, that has been implemented in Applications 9. The due dates and due values are calculated automatically for the serial when the affected transactions are performed. And when a PMC task is uh, completed at an earlier due value, such as the operational uh, parameter interval, or an earlier due date based on calendar interval, the calculation of the next due value or date uh, takes these into consideration now. Uh, the performance has been improved. So if you take a look at this example here where there were about uh, over 4 million serials in the database and 19 million records of operational logging history. Um, you, with 24 parallel processes, uh, that can be run in about two and a half hours. Um, and with 12 processes, that could be run in about six and a half hours. Uh, so if the do calculations are available in one place, the user does not have to remember which form to launch. Uh, for the calculations, the due dates and values are always uh, able to be kept up to date because you can run these uh, more often. And the due calculation for post-maintenance check is now aligned with all the other due uh, calculations. So the way this uh, performance improvement has been put into place, before there was a background job that recalculated the due dates for the interval maintenance that was processed for all serials in one long queue. And now in Applications 9, the user can specify how many uh, chunks to run this in parallel. 
Um, so just as a little indication on the right uh, graphic of where the administrator um, or a super user, type end user, can set the number of tasks to be executed concurrently based on these uh, different uh, chunks. And the, uh, this provides one option to calculate all task types. So there's now one common dialog box that's been created. It lists all the different uh, types of do calculations valid for a serial. Uh, the user can start all calculations at once, or it can, uh, you can just specifically select the ones you want to have run. And it's available from all the different clients where it existed in Applications 8, included a new place um, in Applications 9, which is uh, the pending, pending task list. Um, the automatic calculation of due dates and values whenever the data changes uh, is now automatically calculated um, when affected by any transactions in the application. This will give the planners uh, due information right away um, at their fingertips that's up to date. And the calculations are run online for a single serial, um, but if you're going to run a whole structure, you should run them in the background to avoid performance issues. So the post-maintenance check calculation improvements, um, before the post-maintenance check was perform is performed a little early, and the following um, uh, made some shifts, so it was a little more um, reliable. So the due calculation for post-maintenance checks is now aligned with all the other due calculations. So if you have a specific aircraft uh, number, uh, interval and limit, um, you can see how it will actually go through. It will generate the uh, post-maintenance check and, and how those are done versus uh, in the prior versions of uh, before Apps 9. And in, in Apps 9, you can see that it will actually go ahead and uh, take those into account as to how it uh, runs the actual um, calculations. There's been some changes to the absolute and scheduled due dates. So the benefit is that the absolute due date for calendar intervals is always displayed. The user can see forecasted due dates and values for all operational parameters uh, having a defined interval. There is a stable and clear presentation of due dates and values uh, that is presented to the user. The presentation of these due dates and values does not change from day to day. The due date for the interval maintenance is now based on the sign-off date of the previous task, meaning all task types are now aligned. The calendar due date will be calculated and stored in the calendar-based intervals, uh, based on calendar-based intervals. Uh, and the user-defined sorting number will indicate which of the five operational parameters should be displayed when the due information is presented. So here you can see now in the uh, serial part where you have uh, operational parameter per maintenance group and you have a due info sorting uh, value that's there for up to five, um, and that can be used, and, and here's where it's actually set. Due information for the calendar and the operational parameter intervals is now displayed. So you can see here on the screen on the uh, task distribution pending task where you'll have uh, the various date information um, is now displayed on that on that form. And due information for the uh, all the operational parameters, so if you are on a serial maintenance looking at interval maintenance and drilling into that, you can see here where you have now all of the different um, dates that are required here um, that are needed for being able to look at the due value, the forecasted due date, operational parameter remaining value um, are displayed in a splitter. Uh, there is a new window, um, a new screen to show the due information per task that's been created. So if you drill down, you'll see due information per task, uh, and that will give you the uh, various information related to that. And there's been additional changes made to the operational log archiving. So some customers have experienced performance issues due to the volume of historical loggings that they built up over multiple years. Uh, these historical operational uh, logging records are used in many of the transactions like due calculations, uh, reporting faults, performing a condition measurement. 
um, but very old historical records may longer may not be used needed by the systems anymore, uh, but should be kept for documentation purposes uh, in case any incidents occur. So the concept is to introduce an archive to hold the historical operational logging records that are no longer used by the application. A uh, fairly straightforward archive uh, type of uh, activity tool. And the archiving of these historical loggings on a regular basis will prevent the amount of um, loggings from becoming too large. And the operational logging history that is no longer needed for, you know, daily activities uh, will still be present um, for any kind of uh, requirements to view it for regulatory uh, reasons or documentation reasons. So here is where you'll have that set in the archiving of operational loggings uh, screen. So an archive date is given and all the historical operational loggings prior to or equal to this date will be removed from the operational logging history to the archive. Uh, the archiving happens for the entire fleet, not for individual or groups of serials. And the archiving process can be executed as a background job uh, to not affect um, performance and tie-up screens. So here is where you can um, enter the up until date and you, you know, some information about uh, what you're doing, whether you want to run it in the background. And then the <laughs> archive uh, loggings will actually uh, keep track of all the information that's logged there. Uh, you can restore the um, archived operational loggings. So again, the restore date is given all the historical loggings equal to that date or moved back. Uh, into the op from the operational logging archive, um, so it's useful whenever there's anything that was incorrectly archived. Um, so it, again, it shows where you actually do that on the screen. You know, again, where you enter the date, whether you want to run it in background or not. There's also now uh, some changes to the correct operational loggings. So there's a new client that's been introduced. Uh, to add a missing operational logging between two existing loggings or correct an existing logging or mark a logging as being redundant. Uh, the correction of the logging can also be spread on uh, onto the structure. And if a user makes an error when reporting an operational logging, it's now possible to correct the logging for the vehicle and its components. And recording the correction will ensure that maintenance is undertaken at all the correct time and the fleet is not operated beyond any maintenance due dates. So here is where you would add an operational logging. Um, so you can see here where there is a correction screen that's been added. Uh, missing operational logging can be added between two existing loggings for a selected serial. Uh, valid parameters for the serial's maintenance group can be logged. And when logging is added, all the subsequent loggings in the serial uh, operational log history are adjusted automatically. And here you can see where I want to add an operational logging. Um, so that information can be entered in there. And you'll see where that is um, added into uh, the operational log. Add an operational log. If you want to spread that um, on the structure, there's a checkbox. Um, so all loggings for a serial in the structure will be adjusted as well. Uh, the, the new logging is spread on the configuration of the structure at the time of the logging date. And the logging added will be marked as a, a corrective transaction in the history log. And here's where you would see um, where you have that correction um, transaction. and uh, correction remark that was added during the actual addition of that uh, correction of log, correct the logging. Uh, you can also modify and remove an operational logging. So an existing logging can be changed or marked as redundant. And to mark a logging as redundant, you just set the add-on value to zero. Uh, all subsequent loggings will be adjusted. And if indicated, the change can, again, also be spread across the structure. Uh, and you'll see where that um, actually would take place in the, in the log, in the history log. Uh, you can also modify and remove an, an operational logging. So a modified logging will be marked as a corrective transaction, and the, corrective, the correction value will be stored in the operational log history. In addition, the transaction will be created in the serial part history, in the part serial history, I'm sorry. 
And here you can see where that is uh, in the uh, material part history, where that correction is. Some additions to the post-maintenance check definition. Uh, the generic post-maintenance check definition allows for control definition and the reuse of post-maintenance checks. Part numbers and revisions are assigned, allowing to control uh, which type of material that can be utilized in the different post-maintenance check definitions. Intervals are defined for each assigned part. Instructions, sequencing, and sign-off requirements are connected to the assigned part revisions. Journal tracking of the changes for the active post-maintenance check definitions. And there is a separate post-maintenance check history to keep track of executed post-maintenance checks. So the benefit of this is all the different task types uh, of work in the same way, all the task type work in the same way without any limitations to some task types. And a new post-maintenance check uh, functionality is generic and can be easily extended to other task types as part of a customer project or in future uh, versions of IFS. So here is where you would uh, define that um, in the post-maintenance check uh, definition, and uh, revision handling is enabled, uh, as well as status handling. Uh, so you have a preliminary and active and an obsolete, and you can connect the documents all at that, that same place. And you can define the intervals for the parts. So intervals are defined using operational parameters or calendar. Uh, do calculation will present the one that gives the earliest date. And intervals can be modified for active definitions as long as there are no active post-maintenance checks uh, using this definition. And new parts cannot be assigned for any active definition. Um, so here is where those uh, changes would be in the operational parameter interval or based on calendar interval. Assigned part revisions, the assigned part revision control, which um, provides serial modifications, can utilize different post-maintenance check definitions. Uh, it's used to connect instructions and sign-off requirements, and all revisions of a part are automatically assigned when the are, are automatically assigned when the part is assigned. So here you can see where you um, have that in the post-maintenance check definition, assigned part revisions, and um, you know, where that would come into place. You can also connect instructions and sign-off requirements. So you can connect or remove instructions. You can define materials and tools per instruction. You can view the subtask. You can define the instruction sequencing for the post-maintenance check, and you can define any sign-off requirements um, in the instructions, operations, uh, check area. Um, or if you go down into the material usage requirements under instructions, the tools and facilities required, um, any subtasks that have to be completed, the specific sequencing uh, related to that weekly inspection, uh, or any sign-off requirements that are required. So it gives you that whole post-maintenance check definition um, uh, structure underneath the instructions tab. There's, uh, so in the journal tracking area, there's the following events are tracked. So you know, when you ever you activate that post-maintenance check definition, when you modify the intervals for the post-maintenance check definitions in the status of active, you add, and re add or remove part revisions from any definitions that are in the status of active, uh, add or remove instructions that are in that same uh, status of active, or you set the post-maintenance check definition to obsolete. And we connect the post-maintenance uh, check to the faults and modifications, so it's no longer a full post-maintenance check definition on faults and modifications. Only the reference to the relevant post-maintenance check definition um, is there. And all modifications, um, it is assigned part revisions that hold the uh, reference to the post-maintenance check definition. So uh, this is a screenshot of Applications 8, where you have that uh, defined post-maintenance uh, check and the additional tab there. 
when you look at where it is in Applications 9, uh, so here is where the assigned part revision and the fault and the additional uh, information is stored. And looking at how you handle those post-maintenance check tasks, there is one common task type, which is called the post-maintenance check. Operations are fetched whenever the maintenance order is set to under preparation. And sign-off requirements are fetched when the maintenance order is set to released. And you have a separate post-maintenance check history. Uh, so here you can see in that post-maintenance, um, where the post-maintenance definition is uh, set, the calendar due date information, any operational parameter due date information, and the originating task information. And here you can see in the actual history um, list where that would show up. Engineer and maintenance planner lobby has been introduced. So in IFS Applications 9, uh, one of the major um, enhancements is to make it easy to uh, visualize a lot of information using what's called the lobby concept. So in the uh, fleet and asset management area, there is an engineer maintenance planner lobby. And this maintenance and planner lobby um, is, uh, this is what it would look like, and it would display many of the different uh, areas that you would want to look at. Um, such as parts details, pending approvals, pending deferrals, uh, fleet status, any that are unserviceable, serviceable, serials with overdue tasks, um, the overdue tasks themselves, overdue tasks per part, incomplete tasks, tasks coming due. Uh, you can also see orders coming due, um, specific customers that those orders might be associated with, faults per fault function, False raised um, versus actioned and false reporting trend. Uh, so these are um, adjustable and configurable to the end user's requirements, but this ships um, out of the box with applications nine. There also is a fleet management technician lobby. And again, this one is targeted towards a uh, fleet management or a fleet maintenance technician lobby. So this would be the fleet maintenance technician lobby where it would show them planned work, assigned versus available uh, time, assigned work overview, uh, work that's assigned, all work, pending deferrals, um, imminent work not released for non-routines, conditional measurements. So you can see here where uh, a maintenance, a fleet maintenance tech, you know, could see a lot of information very quickly and it can drill directly into the transactions from the lobby and be able to execute against uh, the information that's displayed in the lobby. I'm going to move over a little bit to some of the component maintenance repair and overhaul um, enhancements that were put into uh, application 9. Uh, one is in the area of part exchanges. So if you are using the component repair, uh, there has been um, changes to the core business to support many of the service providers. Uh, that manage several part exchange processes, uh, such as single exchange, customer loan, and a double exchange. So in the single exchange, it's used when the customer sends a part in for repair or service and receives an immediate replacement from the supplier uh, in exchange. And when confirming the receipt of the repair unit, the ownership may transfer uh, to the actual uh, supplier or service provider. And when the customer approves the delivery of the exchange part, it will be transferred to the customer. So this is a little indication of what that would look like. Um, in the case of a customer loan, the loan exchange is used when the customer receives a loaner part. Um, no ownership change actually takes place in regards to that. Uh, and then a little more complicated one is what's called the double exchange, in which they send a part in for the actual repair. They receive a loaner while it's being repaired. And again, no um, ownership change takes place, but parts do um, flow back and forth. So in the area of handling those parts exchange, I mean, the benefit is it supports uh, core um, core exchange, part exchange uh, programs between suppliers, customers, and, and uh, service providers. Improves the efficiency for managing uh, multiple assets with different exchange requirements from a single centralized repair operation. 
uh, improve stock accountability so you know exactly where components are, what their status is whenever they're in an exchange loop, and it supports some of the different demands that you see when you're working with these um, exchange processes. So if you take a look at where that is, it's under the Component Repair uh, Exchange uh, tab. So you have Exchange Line, so the new tab Exchanges is introduced um, to complement the Repairs tab. So you have the Repairs tab, and here's the Exchange tab. And the Exchange Line controls the logistics of the parts that are in the Exchange loop. And then the Exchange Code would determine, you know, what type of an exchange it is, a single, a double, or a loaner. And you have various actions you can perform on that exchange line. You can reserve and dispatch exchange parts from stock. You can reserve and dispatch loan parts from stock. You can record a customer approval of the dispatch parts. You can scrap exchange parts at the customer. You can receive and confirm exchange parts. And you can receive and confirm loan parts. Um, some additional actions that are available on the exchange line, you can receive and return accessories that are associated with an exchange part. Uh, you can change from one exchange scenario to another uh, based on conditions, like when you receive a part and it's not repairable, you know, you know there may be a, a need to change it from a, a, a loan to an actual um, sale exchange. And you can add, modify sales lines to manage the cost outside of the uh, contracted agreement if you need to. There is a receipt history that's also been added. So the re receipt history uh, provides an overview of all the transactions as well as it can um, work with the other uh, tools such as quick charts and other analytical tools uh, that IFS provides. And there is a dispatch history which provides an overview of all the transactions for the outbound um, goods and serves as a, a way of easily looking at information. So that completes the um, summary of what's changed in Asset and Fleet Management Applications 9. If you want to learn more, you can go to the OpenIFS uh, forum using your uh, IFS portal account, either through the Internet Support Center or through OpenIFS. Uh, go to the forum for upgrading IFS. There is a enhancement spreadsheet you can download. Uh, there's also another tool. You can open that spreadsheet, click on the current version you're on. It'll give you a summary of all the enhancements uh, since that version. Uh, also, where you are watching this informational webcast, there's 100 uh, plus other informational webcasts and demos, and this gives you some information on uh, where you can download uh, quick start guides related to that. Um, and it's, again, it's simply in the ifsevents.webex.com site in the training center. So with that, I thank you for attending this uh, webcast on asset and fleet and asset management in Applications 9, and I uh, hope you attend uh, many of the other webcasts. Thank you.